right. Welcome to Launch Today, the podcast focused on what it takes to get your new business to a million dollars in revenue. From marketing tactics to incredible guest interviews, we focus on sharing behind-the-scenes insight from masters in their field. If you want to, hang on, I just got a pop-up from whatever. All right, so if you want to grow your revenue for your startup or business, you don't want to miss today. Because I've known John Biggs for a decade, and he has greater experience in seeing startups rise and fall and documenting them from both the inside and the outside than almost anybody else in the world. yeah. Jonathan, sorry, not Jonathan. Good help me. John is a multifaceted <laughs> luminary. J- Jonathan Bigsington the uh, third. No, so, John is a multifaceted luminary in tech and in media. Uh, he's a former editor at TechCrunch and a New York Times reporter. He's got a really a rich background in journalism with a keen focus on technology and innovation. He's the founder of Typewriter Plus, Wristwatch Review, and co-founder of a great number of ventures, which blend his media experience and business acumen. Currently, John is steering the Media Co-Pilot, where he explores the intersection of AI, media, and journalism, and he's also teaching a class on journalism and AI at NYU. Entrepreneurs, gear up. This should be a great episode from somebody who's both been in the arena and really howdy, howdy. hundreds of people who've been in the arena themselves. John, thanks for coming on the show. So I'll hop right into this, right? I've known you, I think the first time you and I ever corresponded, and you may not recall, would have been back when I okay. made a press release to TechCrunch for a startup <laughs> called You Get It, and I, I misspelled a word in the headline of the press release, and you just replied with that, <laughs> highlighted, and I think it was effing really. Was well, I, I, see, I don't, That's well, okay, I, that, you that would have been, the start. I, I've, I've gone through a number of, of mental models over the past over the past few decades, so that, it's entirely feasible that that version of John was was interacting with you at that time. I feel like I'm a, I feel like I'm a chat GPT version. I was like, I was three point, I was 2.0 a couple of years, like maybe 20 years, 10 years ago. And now I'm kind of like at just about 4.0. I'm, I'm, you can talk to me without, without driving yourself crazy. Yeah. So that was, I think mm-hmm. the first time we corresponded and since then we've been in touch off and on for over a decade. You've got extensive experience in tech journalism and the star space in general. What do you see emerging right now here sure. in 2024? Well, look, I think we're, so for to keep decades, up. let's say between 2004 and about 2014, I want to say, I was able to see the future, right? And this wasn't anything that I was like, I wasn't anything special. I was just in a position where I was able to see everything coming down the pike that was interesting. Lots of people were sharing stuff with me that I could I could understand what was coming, what was going to be, what was going to improve in the world, and that that go that went for hardware, software, startups, services, all that other good stuff. Like when I saw Uber, I understood that okay, well, mo- this this sort of mobility is going to be the next big thing. When I saw uh, when I saw the Palm Pilot, I knew that it was going to fail. Um, OS uh, phone web I could forget what I forget what the uh, web OS I guess they called it at that time. Palm One, I knew it was going to fail because the the Apple iPhone was coming out. I, I saw the Apple iPhone and I knew that was going to be succeed. It's all fairly basic stuff that you could kind of tell just by seeing what the market looked like and, and and what people were into. And in about 2014, we got a lot of noise in the signal, and a lot of that noise came from crypto, and a lot of that noise came from the the weaponization of the nerd through financial means. So before talking with like somebody who was like a really heavy duty programmer or developer or hardware designer, I could basically say, okay, what are you guys working on? And they'd explain it to me in fairly simple terms. And I could re-explain that to the rest of the world. Once we got the, the ability to write, I don't know, a thousand lines of code, a hundred lines of code, whatever the, whatever the Bitcoin protocol is and make millions of dollars instantly, we weaponized the nerd to a degree that was almost unconscionable. The, the the old the old view of hey I'm going to make a Ubuntu VGA graphics driver for my graphics card that I have from 2002, and I want to have it run on my computer, and I want to run Ubuntu with it, and I'm gonna all the only thing I'm going to get out of that is just like people are going to be friendlier to me at the next Ubuntu uh, con or something like that. It's like sort of like that sort of that sort of social proof that you get just from doing something good to adding it to the system. Most things that happened after 2014 
didn't add anything to the system. And in fact, they, they detracted from it. A lot of the crypto stuff, a lot of the ICO stuff, the NFT stuff, it was such a loud thing in the industry that it drowned out almost everything else. At the same time, you had really, really boring interstitial technologies. Nothing really improved. Phones were basically just rectangles for years and years and years. And nobody said, hey, we're going to make something amazing and new. Now, after we hit the Gen AI revolution, which is only about a year old, if you really want to, if you really want to argue it, all that stuff is going away. So the next startup has to be in a position to do a few things. First off, the weaponization of the nerd, the weaponization of tech for financial gain is no longer there. You, maybe there's a way that you can, you can convince a bunch of dupes to buy into your, I don't know, NFT scheme or something like that. But vast majority of these things are, are everybody's figured it out, everybody's done, and the, the technology, blockchain technology is either going to disappear or get subsumed in the, in, the, in the world. And the value of adding, allowing humans to expand their consciousness, expand their ability, expand their skills is essentially, is essentially right there in front of us, and that value is immense. So that's what Gen AI is going to offer us. Now, the people who are doing the best stuff in Gen AI are the people who are seeing where humans and AI interact and intersect. And that's going to be vital because we don't want AI to do stuff by itself. For example, I, I, there, was just a, there was just a post. Elon Musk would post something and like a million people would get underneath and like comment on it. Say, hey, that's great. Oh, my, that's a good, smart, smart idea. blah blah, blah and all this stuff. And if you looked and recently there was a bug in the system that was being used and every single one of those replies got a reply back from OpenAI saying this, this use of OpenAI is, is, what you call it, is against the terms of service. So all these ghost, ghost accounts were arguing with, with each other on, under Elon Musk's post and they were essentially saying the same thing. I can't, I can't answer this question. I can't, I can't write this thing. It was really funny. So you had thousands of these people, these fake people just talking to each other, but they weren't really talking. They were just saying, hey, I can't talk because this is against the terms of service. That's what happens when you put, when you take the human out of the equation. Now, I say that AI is kind of like the, the motorcycle of the mind, whereas the computer was the bicycle of the mind. The, the bicycle, you still have to do a little bit of work. With AI, you don't, and the motorcycle, you don't have to do a lot of work at all. And it gets you further and fast, and gets you further faster than anything else out there, which is going to be vital. I mean, I think I think what we're doing is we're entering a new stage of evolution where, whereas before we had a database in our hands, which meant we had a database in our heads, now we have an entire personality in our hands, which means we have an entirely new personality in our heads. The startups that use those tools to help people move to the next level of, uh, of ability. And I would don't want to say consciousness because it sounds a little bit like age of Aquarius kind of stuff, but let's, let's call it consciousness are going to be the ones that, that matter stuff that basically says that allows, allows me to have a podcast, record a podcast with a co-host that's going to suggest good questions for you. For example, it's going to say, Oh, Trevor really likes, I don't know, horse racing. So let's talk about horse racing or something like that. It's kind of whispers to me in the same in the same vein something that tells me don't eat that cake because it's gonna it's gonna incle- increase your I don't know blood sugar levels and you're gonna get and you're gonna want to eat more and you're gonna get fat something like that. So we're in this weird world where startups have the opportunity to strip away almost every aspect of our technological world and leave only the magic. And the startups that are able to leave only that magic and understand that concept are the ones that are going to win right now. So uh, rather to what you're saying, I think a lot about the Joaquin Phoenix movie, Her, where you've got really what is a, a smartphone, you know, sitting here in your pocket. And we're, we're just this close to, I think, that being possible right now. And indeed, I'm seeing at CES, they're basically rolling that out. And I'm like, well, I mean, look, there's, the, I think, the I think you looked at her, there's still be a nature of what you can do with it. So, yeah. So I would agree. I would agree that there's, there's plenty of dystopia brewing in our collective consciousnesses. There's plenty of dystopia brewing in our culture. And we could go the way of dystopia if we're not careful. 
and we're never careful. So the the possibility of us ending up and ending up in some dystopian future is is I don't know. It's fairly fairly high. <laughs> but I like to think that once we have an extra brain, we're going to be a lot smarter about stuff. Like I think with a, I think one of the one of the biggest issues right now is disinformation. And it's not even dis, it's not even disinformation. It's the it's the need to it's the need to push past the noise of the internet to get a message across. So if I'm a journalist or if I'm a if I'm a news organization or if I'm even Netflix and I just want somebody to watch my thing, I have to make it either as salacious or as interesting, quote unquote interesting or as TikTok worthy or as cool or as unusual as possible to get that million page views that I need to get 10,000 potential customers, which gets me a thousand potential dollars, let's say. The, the, the economics here are completely dismal. Now, if I had a robot that's sitting in the background that says, hey, John, you know what? You're really into this, I, this story about, the, about a kitten that fell out of a tree. Well, they saved the kitten. The kitten's fine. Here, check this out. And I know you really like the Pixies. Here's another band that sounds just like the Pixies. I think you'd get a kick out of it. There are a lot of other people who are enjoying it, et cetera. So if we have if we have a curator, just like bloggers used to be curators of web content, if we have a curator that sits there and just kind of like feeds us this information, the the benefit of producing garbage goes down immensely because garbage doesn't get recommended. Because the AI can potentially say like, oh, well, this is junk. This has nothing to do with, with no bearing on my, my user's life. So I'm not going to share it. So the, the her vision, also the her vision suggested that, the, that her eventually became so sentient. The, the, the whatever, Scarlett Johansson in the movie eventually became sentient and started talking to like, I don't know, the, the digital version of Einstein and then went to Mars and all this other stuff. And that's, that's, a, that's a trope that we've seen before in Neuromancer. Where if you unlock the AI, if you take if you take the if you take the digital shotgun from away from its head, then you yes. basically get another another sentient human who could be to potentially be all powerful. In in the case of her, it becomes all powerful by taking itself away. In the case of Neuromancer, if you've read that book, it becomes all powerful by essentially hiding in the background and convincing humans to do its bidding because it doesn't have any arms and legs. And it convinces it, it convinces humans to do its bidding by through by simulating. I guess it was like the voodoo canon. You created an entire created mythology based on the voodoo uh, history of voodoo, and uh, and each each AI, each version of the AI, had a separate god that it was associated with, and it got an entire like co- like group of people to support it that way, which is kind of ingenious on on William Gibson's part, and it's also ingenious on the AI's part. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I do also, I'm talking to folks who are in the AI space. I I think it's important to realize the difference between being like the folks mm-hmm. who invest $10 million in building a vector database and the folks who are building on top of them. And there's a lot of startups are succeeding even though like open AI may have mm-hmm. features that compete with what they've done by packaging it up and really focusing the message on we do just this, they win. And I do think in an era where with no code and low code and AI helping mm-hmm. you write code, it's so much easier to do the tech part that you're mentioning, right? It used to be you had your tech wizards write the code, and now AI can do a lot of heavy lifting. I do think for a lot of founders, being able to get your message dialed in, finding the right audience, mm-hmm. building that audience is going to be increasingly important not enough just to build it because nobody else could yeah i mean that's that's definitely that's definitely what we're what we're up against so what we're seeing right now is the cleaving of i guess you would say redundancy in most corporations and cleaving is cleaving would be suggested suggestive of a, a removal of the redundancy and this is a super cynical and super sad way of thinking about it but who needs a entry level python programmer when the when the mid level python programmer can basically say hey hey open ai i need a you need a script to read this csv file and output every unusual value or something like that or i need a i need a ray trace algorithm that's fairly popular and that i can use and and i think managers are going to kick themselves 
CEOs are going to kick themselves for what they're doing right now. Because what they're doing right now is they're, they're releasing humans from jobs where you can get the development chops of a 10-year, 20-year veteran out of a one-year veteran with fairly quickly and just by giving them the co-pilot tools, just by giving them some of these AI tools. Plus, you're going to have some sysadmin or whatever who doesn't want to use the tools and they're going to get angry and they're going to want to quit and all that other good stuff. That's not, that can't be helped. But you're losing, you're losing talent that you're going to need eventually because eventually there's going to be a situation where, okay, well, me and this AI are going to be coding together and it's going to be team coding and we're going to get so much done that we're going to have more work than we can imagine. So it's super short-sighted and it's a com- going to be a complete mess. And the same, same goes for marketing and PR. A lot of marketing and HR and all that other stuff, all the soft skills, I suppose you could say, are being removed because CEOs think, oh, well, I don't need to, I don't need this dude to e- write emails for HubSpot anymore. I can just do that myself by saying, I am a CEO of a major SaaS company. Write me an email to convince somebody to buy my product. The result is absolute garbage, but I'm too dumb to know it. And there's nobody in my staff who has the institutional experience and institutional memory to know, yeah, this doesn't work for people. So again, we're looking at something extremely short-sighted. How long is it going to last? I don't know. I think we're going to be in a situation where where this whole winter is going to last for maybe another quarter, two quarters, and then investment and everything is going to pop back up again because VCs are also stupid and they want to follow the new the last biggest new thing and they're everything's moving so fast that they have no idea what to follow. So they're like the cat with the laser pointer. They're just going to keep going and and but they're never going to write a check because they have no idea who's 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 there and who's not. You're getting a lot of AI washing, for example. I just recently wrote about this, where you you add AI to your to your business plan and you immediately raise your raise your valuation. Nobody wants to see that, and it's not going to work. So if you're a startup, if you're a startup owner right now, hundred percent, it's super easy to make a make a Python program or write, make a I don't know make a web app for yourself or make a regular app for yourself. I use it all the time. I say, I say, hey, uh, give me a Laravel code to do XYZ in, in PHP instantly, comes back instantly, and I'm ready to go. And it's amazing. That gives me a false sense of security because I have no idea if that stuff's secure, if that thing's going to work, if it's going to scale well. I have no experience. And AI, the AI doesn't have any experience either. So you really can't depend on that. It's nice to think that, yeah, I can get away without having a CTO for the first, I don't know, six months of my company, but it's also kind of stupid. And if I'm a smart person and I'm a smart CEO and I'm building something, you need people. You don't need you don't need to you don't need ChatGPT. ChatGPT is the tool that you that you that you use to to get you there faster. It's, a, it's equivalent to like saying, oh well, we don't need any more reporters because we have Microsoft Word. Yeah, absolutely. You had in 1985, you had a green screen. Now you have Microsoft Word. That's pretty cool. But the but the overall, you still need somebody to stick the stick the words into Microsoft Word to put into the newspaper. Got that. Cool. All right. So you've written powerfully before in your blog and in the Mm -hmm. emails that you send out about failure and startups and mental health, and you run Keep Going, a podcast about failure and success. Talk a bit about Mm -hmm. failure for founders and how do you survive it? Like You and I have both had a fair share of things not going well. How do you get through? What do you do to... To I keep the, going when things the aren't going. First through. thing you have to remember is that there is a point in any startup that you know it's time to quit. Now you're not going to hear that from the hustle culture weirdos. You're not going to hear that from the LinkedIn bros. You're not going to hear that from I don't know the shark Shark Tank people. But at some point you have to realize that your idea is just not going to work for whatever reason, and you're going to run out of money. You're going to run out of time. You're going to have competitors that are going to beat you. Now, the way to think about that is not that the startup failed. It's that you built a foundation for yourself for the next thing and the next thing after that. Slack, for example, was an internal tool. I forget what Brent, I forget what Butterworth was doing. I think it was like some kind of VR gamer. Yeah, he was making a video game. But but historically... He was making a yeah, video. So historically, game. Butterworth, the CEO, and really liked messaging services. I think he had, I think he had a messaging service before, and he and he was building things, and he was always building these things. 
So it was like it was like the it was like the close encounters of third kind, like the the, the mountain made out of mashed potatoes. The, this means something, right? This this idea that that you want to sh- that you want to communicate means something. So they kept on building and building and building. They were building this MMO. It wasn't going well, but they had a they had a background platform that was basically where they were chatting with each other. And the same thing was true of Twitter, if you want to think about it that way. And because he had had the experience of building these messaging platforms over and over and over again in a, in a almost ad infinitum, he was able to move very, very quickly to monetize, to sell, to build out tools like Slack. And that's all it really takes. But that's not saying a lot because that all is essentially a lifetime of work that leads to one success. Now, the other problem with failure is that you get told no a lot as a founder. And there is a there's almost a manic need to be positive when it comes to this sort of thing. And you're constantly telling yourself, okay, well, the next answer is not going to be no, and it's going to be no. Now, what that does physically is it actually makes you sick. Your stomach gets sick. Your, your anxiety goes up. Your dopamine drops. You, you basically can't sleep. You feel bad. But you still have to put on this happy face. So your body's warring with its with your mind, and you're fighting against a, you're fighting against a, a a depleting system. The result is depression, and you're going to go through it, and you're going to feel it. And only the most sociopathic of entrepreneurs, the most sociopathic ones, and unfortunately the sociopathic ones win the most because they really don't care about humanity. Except for the most sociopathic ones, building a business, building your own startup, getting to a million dollars, getting a million dollars, getting past a million dollars is is debilitating in most cases. There's gonna be there's gonna be rare exceptions. And those exceptions are the one percent out of the ninety nine percent of the startups that fail. I think it's like eighty five percent of startups fail after the third year or something like that. I forget what the statistic is. And again, I don't wanna I don't wanna yeah, I don't want to bring anybody down, but it's it's going to happen. Yeah. Now, that depression is pernicious, especially in high-performing people, especially in f- focused people. As a generalist, I can I can jump from thing to thing and that's the, much to my detriment to a degree, but at least I can talk a good game. But as a as a highly focused and highly and highly I guess high achieving person, becoming depressed because of even a minor failure in a startup is a very real thing. And you don't know how to handle it because you never had it before. You went through school, you got all A's, you studied really hard at Berkeley or, or Stanford. You impressed your, you impressed your business, business teacher. He gave you $20,000 $20, to do a startup. And while you're at school, you drop out the whole thing. It's all going great until it's not going great. And the possibility of it not going great is really, really high. The result is the result is depression. The result is suicide, which is a which is a disease that or which is a result of that disease associated with high performing startup people, and it's going to happen. I've seen I've seen people reduced to absolute wrecks on their quest to success, and I've seen people leave this world because of their quest to success. The what needs to be understood and what needs to be explained to the world is that nobody got there on their first try. There are plenty of people who might seem to have gotten there on their first try, and there are plenty of people who got loads and loads and loads of help for outsiders as soon as they did their first try. I'm thinking mostly about like a Mark Zuckerberg type who went, it was at Harvard, he made a he made the Facebook and Somebody saw the benefit of that, took a huge chunk of it, and eventually Mark and his lawyers were able to claw that back from certain people. But they took a huge chunk of his idea, and they monetized it quickly, and they used their skills. But most startup entrepreneurs don't have that ability to say, okay, well, there's a super, super experienced person in the eaves waiting for this for this MVP. And once this MVP is out, then they're going to sell it for me and it's going to be great. No, as a startup founder, you have to be the salesperson, you have to be the hustler, you have to be the programmer, you have to be the designer, you have to be everything. And you don't have that help. 
So Mark Zuckerberg is not a good example for a for a startup f- founder. And in fact, it's become a p- slowly more and more apparent that he's not actually a technical founder as much as a person who can just yell at people in a room, very similar to Steve Jobs, again, sociopaths. So yeah, you're going to face you're going to face that that demon, the noonday demon, I guess they called it. Yes. And it's going to be real and it's going to hurt. And the only way out is first off through therapy, potentially through medication, and also just by going through and understanding, yeah, this is not forever. Just because this startup fails doesn't mean the next one will fail. It's going to be a little bit harder to raise capital, but if, if the idea is sound, you should be able to make money on day one, which is something that a lot of people don't think about and a lot of people fail to do it, realizing they need to make money on day one. If your business can make money on day one, then you're set forever. And we don't even have to talk about depression. We don't have to do anything because you are you basically either have a small amount of cash coming in on a SaaS product that runs itself, or you can start to hire people to do the things that you don't want to do and, uh, and, and you're golden. Not a lot of businesses are like that. Not a lot of startups are like that. And we suffer for it. I get that. It is, I was talking to a founder yesterday who is exactly where you're at, right? He's been, I think he's, he mentioned he hadn't paid himself since September. Mm-hmm. He's got his investors keep being like, well, next month we'll get you yeah. that next check. Next month we'll get you that next check. And he's just, he's just defeated by it, right? And he's like, he's building something that's important. He know it, the world will be better if he makes it happen. And seeing that war in him, I'm like, this is so important if I could just build it but I can't, yeah. and just watching that crush him is, like, he's normally a sunny, like, easygoing guy, and he's also, mm-hmm. I think he's, like, in his 50s, he's been through this a lot, but never for his company, and that's the other thing is that, in all of our minds, you see the 22-year-old out of Harvard who does this, right? And, well, oh, they're they're less emotionally mature, they're, they're of course, going to have more emotional ups and downs, but you're average and, and, that, and that ringer is, and that ringer, is especially in that age group, is really difficult, because and first off, it also curtails a lot of innovation because if I'm sitting there at age 45 or whatever and I'm saying, hey, I want to do this startup, I could do all kinds of other better stuff. I don't have to sit there and suffer for my for my art. I could go I could go sit in a cubicle somewhere and and make that make that cash. And I would they, I think whatever I forget who said it, but the but the pram and the harl is death is the death of art. And I would say that the I would say that the cubicle job is the death of entrepreneurship. One one of the things that I noticed in Poland, where we have where we were both in, is that right around 2008, when there was a global crisis, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of smart people, a lot of smart younger people, lost their jobs. And instead of saying, "Oh well, what was me?" they did startups, because that was kind of like the that was an exact that was exactly the right time to do startups. That was exactly the right time to to try to raise money, et cetera. A lot of EU money was coming in. And it was they were lucky because they basically got this opportunity to take that failure and turn it around very, very quickly. Very rare that that happens for anybody outside of, outside of any specific sort of situation like that. But it's nice when it does happen. Gotcha. Speaking of, I guess, success and failure, as a journalist, you've seen hundreds of startups succeed and probably tens of thousands fail, right? There's I, I know you weren't running Deadpool, but for a long time, what TechCrunch mm-hmm. covered was then you'd see, you know, over and over these startups showing up in the Deadpool. And you've seen a lot of founders go through this this struggle. What's your advice to people for the first thing they need to do to maximize their chances to be more successful and not end up on the fit? Well, look, okay, first off, let's not, okay, as 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 cynical and as as as, as da- Debbie Downer as I was just a moment ago, I want to, I want to express that it's a vital that people build. It's vital that people build something good. There was a Louis C. K. bit where where yes. there was a there was a guy who felt bad because he was like he was a, he ran a landscaping business and that people looked down on him. But if you think about what that 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 what Louis C. K. is saying, he's problematic, but whatever. He's saying that yeah, you this guy's building something. This person is building something. This person is trying something. Too often we forget who said it, but we walk around and, and shoes too small for us. And that's, that means we're, we can't go very far. We can't go very fast. And we're constantly in pain because we can't expand our horizons. We can't expand outside of that, outside of that, the, the, the cage that we've stuck ourselves in. And maturity brings 
a lot of that ability. That's why a lot of startup founders are a little bit older because they do have that maturity. They do have the say, they, they do have the will to say, okay, well, you know what? This is stupid. Let's fix it. Whereas younger startup founders see a small problem and think that they can fix it in between going out and hanging out and going to school and, and being a young person and whatever. And older founders say, well, look, this thing killed my dad or this killed my mom or this, this is damaging our psyches. So let's figure something out how to solve it. And that's vital. That's vital work. And entrepreneurship is vital work in the same way for exactly the same points that I just said before, because every time you try, you learn something new and you build upon that. Every time you fail, you get really sad. But every time you try, you, you learn something. And you can use that to your next to your advantage. In terms of in terms of how to do how to be a entrepreneur in the twenty first century, I guess we're in right now. You have to be able to get make money immediately. You have to be able to build an MVP without too much trouble. Something that can make money, or at least something that will get people to sign up. Sign ups don't really work anymore. That 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 idea of that idea of hey let's just get a bunch of sign up a lot of people to sign up and it'll be nice and everybody will be everybody will be using the app for and and we're going to make and we're going to sell it or we're going to do something based on that it doesn't work anymore it's kind of sad you need money and that money can come from multiple multiple sources maybe you consult while you're building the product it's it's perfectly valid but you and your people have to survive the days of hey i'm going to do this for equity are probably over Maybe there's somebody out there who wants to make a web app for, for equity, but I seriously doubt it, and I wouldn't depend on it as a, as a business model. So you just have to think in those terms. You have to think about how can I make money immediately. I see some of the, some of the best entrepreneurs I see out there just can't code for the life of them. And that's a problem. That's actually a major problem because if you don't know how to code, you don't know. If, first off, you know, if, if you hire a coder, you don't know if they're cheating you or not. We had one guy who was working with us on a product and he, we gave him, I believe it was like $6,000 worth of Bitcoin, which probably about a, a Bitcoin and a half a week, I think it was, to dev this thing. He outsourced the dev to another guy who didn't know how to code web app or code um, mobile apps. So they were working together on this thing and he was just kind of like, he was just kind of running us for a while. Just he was just keep, keep, kept on taking the Bitcoin, kept on taking the Bitcoin just to get, just to get some cash in. And he was kind of like working with this guy who was like coding in, coding in, in the background. And we weren't smart enough to say, hey, oh, this isn't work. We need to see this code. Another example, we had a CTO who, who was working with us and we had, we had hired at that point probably about four or five devs. And one of the devs was working in a, I guess it was like a Java Lang, Java framework. And, and we were talking on a call and we said to the CTO, Hey, did you check this guy's work? And he said, no, I don't understand that framework. And we knew at that point that first off the CTO was going to be problematic. And second off, we knew we were suck because we didn't know enough. We didn't know enough to know it was going to be dangerous to us. <laughs> And the resulting, the resulting blowback of that is that we, we hired this other dude and he messed with us and screwed us and, and so on and so on. And it's a it's tale as old as time. So yeah, that, that, that's vital. You have to be the, you have to be a one man band, a one woman band. Right. And it's vital that you at least understand what you're going to be doing. And again, AI can give you the ability to do that. You can basically ask it for a program and it'll kind of dev it for you at least make you an MVP that, that you can host somewhere. Again, it's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination, but you can't just run from place to place. You can't run from meetup to meetup and say, hi, I got this great idea for Fitbit for dogs. And, and people ask you, do you know anything about dogs? No, I don't like dogs. Do you know anything about hardware manufacturing? No, I don't know. I'm going to get somebody for that when I get my million dollars that somebody's going to invest. So you go, well, what, what, do you have any like background in, I don't know, veterinary medicine so you know that the Fitbit's going to work for these dogs? It's like, no, but I'm going to hire a doctor when we have our million dollars. But remember, it's just Fitbit for dogs, right? It's super easy. Anybody can understand that. And that, that deserves cash. It doesn't deserve anything, unfortunately. What it deserves is 
maybe a second look by an investor or maybe a second look by a CTO, potential CTO or hardware manufacturer, but it doesn't, it doesn't deserve cash by any stretch of the imagination. Gotcha. I, I agree. It is. I got my start in business mm -hmm. about 1996. That's nearly 30 years ago, which makes me feel elderly as a PHP dev. And I'm still able to like poorly, but enough Mm -hmm. Right, evaluate code, particularly with Copilot's help these days. You can say, "What's this block of code doing?" And kind of use it the reverse of not, "Hey, write code for me," but explain what's happening here. So uh, that is, I think, a really if you're building a tech product, it's the same. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a similar story of oh, I built a cold email agency. I don't know cold email, and the guy I built it with wasn't the right guy for the job. wasn't able to mm -hmm. build the infrastructure to make it work, and so I I lost like 130k into trying to build an agency with this dude and he couldn't do it. And I know how to code enough to look at like the tech project. I know how to run a marketing agency for performance really well, but cold email wasn't my thing. I didn't know enough. And so when that guy wasn't the right fit for it, it took me a long time, a lot of money to figure it out. I think if you're launching in, whether you're making the Fitbit for dog. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen, dogs, I've seen. Launching a cold email yeah, agency. Again, yeah, this is, there's, there's, cool. there's not always a, there's not always a, this doesn't always happen, but I've seen it enough to say that this is something to consider. I remember one guy wanted to do a, a nano, nanotech startup, um, uh, a nanotech startup, and he knew nothing about nanotechnology. He, was, he didn't have a background. He didn't work there, et cetera. And I think it was graphene or something he was going to work in and just building graphene. And I, I told him constantly, look, man, you got to go work someplace. You got to go be someplace where they're doing this thing and then just go for it. And you have to understand how this works. And then eventually you can quit and you can start your business based on what you've learned from that graphene company. But until then you have, you have to stop because you're basically running around asking people to invest in your graphene company when you don't know how to make graphene nor you know anything about nanotech. So yeah, that's 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 the wrong approach. And I do think some people, they hear the idea of VC funding, get $20 million, and oh, then it's easy street from there. The reverse is exactly true. When you've got the $20 million check, the pressure ramps up. Mm -hmm. So I know you from TechCrunch first, as I mentioned back in the day when you sent back my, my press release. These days I read you a lot on Wristwatch Review. I've read your book, Marie Antoinette's Watch, back when it was new. I just was checking it out so, yeah. today before the show. I'm like, yeah, I think you wrote that a decade ago, mm -hmm. which seemed like that's both yeah, a surprising right. amount of time and also not very much. What do you find so compelling? Like you're you're this guy who talks about tech and about journalism and like you're all over here. I think it's I think that the last thing about time last time is really yeah, compelling yeah, yeah. for you. Sort of a hegemony in terms of in terms of the mechanical arts. First off, mechanical arts were vital at that time. Being a being a being a watchmaker was the equivalent of being, I don't know, the CEO of Intel. Because you were looking at first off, they were vital because you needed you needed a watch, you needed a clock to tra traverse the the planet. You needed to to tell longitude. Some somebody in a in a carriage in London didn't really need a watch, but they kind of did because you had to get up at seven in the morning and to go to the to go to the factory. So you needed some sort of clock. You need to understand timekeeping, etc. And timekeeper sort of regimented our days in ways that we are still feeling today. In terms of the five five day work week, forty hour work week, all that other good stuff, all these hist all these historical things were associated specifically with the rise of clocks and watches, and that was the last time that we had a mechanical, a truly mechanical, scientific improvement to our lives. You could argue that the car kind of did that, but the car was car still with us, and the car is sort of a car is sort of an offshoot of of the horse and buggy. All they did was just replace the horse. Whereas what we did was we, we flattened, we dropped the concept of time onto a, almost an aimless day. And we said, well, we got to go somewhere at two o'clock. And we had a little watch on our wrist that told us it was two o'clock. And you could get a better watch that could tell you what time the sun was going to set, what time the tide was going to come in. It would chime the hour, all this other good stuff. And these were these were improvements to our lives and changes to our lives that, that brought on the Industrial Revolution. So I would also argue that the, the timepiece, the watches are the only technology that like somebody like a Ben Franklin could look at. He would come back for come back from the dead and, and enter our world and he'd look at our clocks and watches and say, Yeah, I get that. That's that's how that works. 
So we're looking at sort of a Precambrian tool that still walks among us, similar to the alligator or the crocodile or the chicken. It's a dinosaur that's evolved into a point where hey, it's it's hidden it's hidden in plain sight. I, I... I got you. I recently had to make the unhappy upgrade from I have a couple of, of automatic twelve winding watchers. Upgrade to a smartwatch mm -hmm. simply because it has a silent mm -hmm. alarm, and my wife was sick of getting awakened at 5.30 in the morning mm -hmm. with my phone alarm. And so I'm still a little sad about it, right? Because I also like Baroque, like complicated mm -hmm. timepieces. But that's such an interesting view. It's a yeah. pre-Cambrian dinosaur that walks among us and still retains its utility, too. Unlike, yeah, you know, exactly. I can buy a buggy, but unless I'm a Mennonite, I'm not going to make much use out of it. But the same wristwatch that Ben mm -hmm. Franklin could have had uh, would be equally useful today. That's an interesting view. I like it. So you you read a lot. I mean, everybody who's in, in your space reads a lot. Other journalists, fiction too, I imagine. What's something you've read recently that you mm. think be valuable for entrepreneurs? There are a few there are a few things that I've read recently. The War of Art. The War of Art by Pressfield, I think it was. Stephen Pressfield. It's a it's a book about forcing yourself to create. He did another he did another book called Do the Work. There's also put your put your butt where put your ass where your heart is. I think he did another another one of that. One of those books. I don't like a lot of those books, but I think they're fairly valuable. I've been reading a lot about the Stoics. I'm reading a little bit about Jungian therapy and the idea of maturity and growth and the value of both of those in a world that doesn't doesn't, I guess you would say, reward it. And in terms of fiction, nonfiction, the problem is I have, I've read so much stuff that I can't like think of one book, but I have, it's johnbiggs.substack.com. Those are my great reads that I have. See, oh, like, like say I, I read a nice book, The Left Behind, Decline and Rage in Small Town America. And I read that because I'm fascinated by that topic because my grandmother, I grew up in a basically small town, Ohio. We had my grandmother's house. And I understand, and I understood that 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 anger because what had happened, and I don't think it's I don't think it's still true. Well, let's 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 let me pref preface that. What's happened to those places is that the perception that I can live there, grow up there, and still be a success has been severely curtailed by the media, by reality, the remote jobs, all that other good stuff. It's great. And absolutely, we have to create remote jobs for the world. We have to have people go. We have to have, have people live in Wheeling, West Virginia, and be able to work in work in Stanford, for example, or work in California. And it's it's coming, but it's not quite there yet. So you basically have this entire swath of America, and you would argue this swath of Europe, that's completely disconnected from the from the entrepreneurial spirit, the innovative spirit. I remember distinctly. You would, if you read it, if you read any history. You can see you can see people coming out of all these weird places. I don't know presidents and scientists and generals, and artists and entrepreneurs coming out of all these weird places. Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I don't know Hilliard, Ohio, and all these different like smaller towns. That used to be the norm because you didn't really have this sort of this sort of conglomeration of intelligence on the coasts. Uh, we can argue if it's intelligence or not. What you have now is you have this sense of despair. And if you read this book, you kind of see that that despair isn't always there, that those people are extremely proud of where they live, that the opportunities are there, and maybe they don't mind some, they don't want some of the things that, that city folk think are good. That said, there's a lot of rage associated with that, and that has to be taken into consideration as we grow. Because again, if we're laying people off willy-nilly, Who's going to go first? It's going to be some middle manager in a place that's not making too much money and doesn't need that many people anymore or is going out of business entirely. So if you if you economically strangle a place, it's just super, super violent to that place and it's super dangerous to the to the people there. Every every few jobs lost is a, is, is a reduction in health, a reduction in safety, reduction in mental health, etc.,
Was it? Okay. That's a, a really interesting read. I will check it out. One last question before we wrap this up, because we're running, running tight on time. You write and think a lot about AI and journalism and, and the future of what AI is doing to us and with us and for us. I don't think anything worries what me about worries it. you I about AI? What, what I'm worried about is that, as exactly as I said, that that this that the lazy lazy manager is going to see it as a as a way to replace humans, and it's not going to be. And those lazy managers are going to get situations like the like the freaking Boeing blowouts recently, but on a larger scale. And what excites me most is, again, it's that motorcycle of the mind, the ability to, to expand our horizons, expand our consciousness using these tools that, that reduce the, tech, the com- complexity of most technologies to almost zero, to a point where all I have to do to make a program is to ask for it. And that's magic. And if we don't see that, if we don't understand that, then we're missing a huge portion of what this really is. We can argue about plagiarism. We can argue about all that stuff all day long and absolutely needs to be solved and there are ways to solve it. But being able to, being able to write in plain English well and use that in my, I don't know, application essay or a resume or whatever levels the playing field in ways that are unparalleled. If everybody can write well, then what happens then? The really good writers get noticed. That's one thing. But the mediocre writers, the mediocre creators, the mediocre programmers can get a little bit of help and they can get a boost. And there's going to be, and there's a situation where you could say, oh, well, those people are being, I don't know, those people are being, using this tool and they're wasting their time or something like that. They're wasting our time because they're, they're, they're stealing this, this information. And they're not. They're basically using a tool in the same way that we use Microsoft Word to make the make their words look better. And if I got a typewritten resume right now, I would say, what the hell's going on here? If I get one that's written in Word but has lots of typos in it, I'm going to be a little bit more weirded out, but maybe I'll bring the person in. But if that resume or if that program or whatever is flawless based on based on generally accepted practices, then we're golden, right? So that's the way to think about it. Super interesting. All right. Well, John, I appreciate what you had to share today. I think we had some really interesting uh, insights and thoughts that you shared, so I appreciate your time. Yeah, people you want to check you out, right? John Big does substack on dogs on anywhere else. People should I think there's a couple of me, but I'm the I'm the I'm the one that comes to the top now. There's there's a yeah. There's a couple of you. There's a and there's and there's a there's a male yeah, no, no, there's a male astrologist who showed up. I think when I look for you, was, but, they would. But don't. Yeah, they would. They would tweet at me at John Biggs, and I would reply. I would reply as them and as the oh, there you say. Go. I don't care about you or your rubbish bins. So. Huh. Really? Huh. That's excellent. All right. Well, all right. Next week, we're going to be talking with Rebel CMO and content marketing expert Inbar Jaeger about launching radical transparency and how to make content that makes a difference for you in 2024. Be sure to subscribe or follow on social media so you don't miss it. Thanks very much, Sean. I'll see you around.